This is Dr. Ben White with the Rational Wellness Podcast, bringing you the cutting edge information on health and nutrition from the latest scientific research and by interviewing the top experts in the field. Please subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast on iTunes and YouTube and sign up for my free ebook on my website by going to drwhites.com. Let's get started on your road to better health. Hello, Rational Wellness Podcasters. Thank you so much for joining me again today. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, please go to iTunes and give us a ratings and review. That way more people will find out about the Rational Wellness Podcast. Our topic for today is dried urine testing for hormones with Dr. Carrie Jones. While conventional medical doctors typically measure hormones only in serum, in the functional medicine world, we've come to appreciate some of the advantages of measuring hormones in Europe so we can capture the hormone metabolites to see if and how these hormones are being uh, processed by the body. Uh, however, hormones fluctuate throughout the day. So measuring 24-hour urine is a way to capture that. But it requires carrying around a large container of urine that must be kept in the fridge between samples. We've also come to appreciate some of the advantages of testing hormones via dried blood and saliva, since it can be done at home by patients instead of requiring a blood draw, which is especially tricky if you're trying to get a patient to get their sample done at a particular point during their cycle, you know, maybe that's going to be a weekend day um, or at a particular time of the day since hormones fluctuate throughout the day. Dried urine seems to offer some of the advantages of combining urine testing with the ease of a saliva or dried spot. Now, look, there are advantages and disadvantages of every form of hormone testing. Serum testing has some advantages since it's most likely to be covered by insurance and it may be the most cost effective. But 95 to 99% of the hormones measured in serum are tightly bound by binding proteins, which doesn't reflect the unbound or free hormones that are available to the tissues. And serum testing cannot measure estrogen or androgen or adrenal metabolites. And it also does not appear to be a good way to monitor men and women who are taking hormones topically. Saliva testing may be a better way to monitor levels of hormones taken topically. However, some of the problems with saliva testing include that it appears to be less consistent, it's adversely affected by eating, drinking, gum chewing, and toothbrushing, which can result in micro damage and can result in elevated salivary testosterone levels for up to an hour after brushing, even in the absence of visible signs of bleeding. 24-hour urine testing has the advantage of being able to measure hormone metabolites over the course of the day, though these will essentially be averaged. The disadvantages of urine testing include that it's only measuring hormones that have been excreted, and it's not a direct measure of bioavailable hormones. An analogy would be measuring how much food people eat by going through their trash cans. Also, urine testing cannot measure thyroid hormones. Um, Dr. Kerry Jones is a naturopathic physician with a master's in public health and over 12 years of experience in functional medicine. She's the medical director for Precision Analytical, the creators of the Dutch dry urine testing. Dr. Jones, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me on. That was definitely one heck of an introduction. You sure covered <laughs> all the key highlights. I think that's. I think we're done. That's it. <laughs> okay. I love it. Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, why would a functional medicine practitioner want to do dry urine testing versus serum or saliva or twenty-four hour urine? Definitely. Well, one of the big things that you touched on was ease and convenience. If uh, a lot of people are afraid to get their blood drawn, right? Um, a lot of people can't come up with the saliva to do a saliva test, uh, to spit in a tube. And they don't want to carry the jug around 24 hours and collect every single last drop of urine they make. And so the dried urine test was created for this happy medium. You get to do it multiple times in the day. You don't have to spit. You don't have to get your blood drawn or your finger poked. And it's little pieces of paper that you urinate on. So convenience is huge. And pretty much everyone you know, can, 
can manage that uh, to urinate on a piece of paper. Uh, but the second thing is what you also mentioned are the metabolites. Now, one of the things you said is that urine doesn't have bioavailable, but in fact it does. Oh, okay. It's the bioavailable that actually that comes through is the free. Um, that's oh, what comes okay. through, not, not the bound. And so, because if it's bound, it can't be metabolized, right? So it's only the bioavailable that can. Okay. And so it does. But metabolites are super important if you're looking for pathways. So if you're a practitioner focused on estrogen and you want to know which pathway, which metabolite your estrogen is going to turn into, urine is the way to do it. You can't get it in blood and you can't get it in saliva. Just like testosterone or DHEA, if you've got somebody, you're concerned about their, their acne, their male pattern baldness, their prostate issues, their PCOS and you're looking to see if they're going down that sort of androgen pathway of naughtiness, then urine is the way to go. Um, saliva and, and, and serum will tell you like your testosterone in the moment, your DHEA in the moment, but that could be normal. But however, it's going down the pathway with all the side effects. Okay, well, why don't, why don't we explore that? Because I, yeah. I think a lot of people are, are at least somewhat aware that the metabolites of estrogen can affect cancer risk, but mm -hmm. I think a lot, a lot of folks are not quite aware what the advantages of um, looking at testosterone metabolites are. Yeah, so when the body makes either DHEA or testosterone, obviously, just like estrogen, it, it, it can push it into other metabolites. Most everyone's familiar with the tab metabolite DHT, right? Dihydrotestosterone, you can check it in serum. Um, but there's other ones, one, and they all have fancy big names. I don't know who decided to name them, but it's things like etiocalanolone, androsterone, 5-alpha, you know, androstenediol. I mean, these are crazy names. But basically what they do as a family is they tell us when you make DHEA or you make testosterone, which side does it go down? Is it pretty much split 50-50 or does it go down the androgenic alpha side primarily or the less androgenic beta side? And so let's say you've got somebody, like I was saying with PCOS, or you've got a man who has cystic acne, he's got male pattern baldness, he's maybe having some prostate issues, and you do a serum testosterone or you do serum even DHEA and it's normal. And you're like, well, that's weird. He has all these symptoms. When you know this pathway, when you can look to see if his androsterone, his DHT, his 5-alpha androsenediol are elevated, then you know this gentleman or even this female is going right down that alpha pathway causing all these symptoms. And more importantly, you can do something about it. You can, you can intervene and try to help. So um, if the testosterone is going down that... Um that pathway of DHT. That's mm -hmm. gonna increase risk of ma male pattern baldness. Mm -hmm. That's gonna increase prostatitis. Does that increase mm -hmm. prostate cancer risk as well? Um, the, so the research is interesting when it comes to uh, prostate risk, uh, prostate cancer risk for DHT. So there's some of the testosterone metabolites, yes, they can, they can increase. Not all of them, but some of them, yeah. So it's good to follow. So what are the best ways to push it the other way? Well, the lifestyle factors is a big one. So what pushes you down the alpha? Sometimes it's genetic. Some people are just genetically alpha folks. Um, and we'll see this as well in their progesterone. Men and women, of course, both need progesterone. But if their alpha pr progesterone's uh, more dominant, we know they're just an alpha person. Um, but other things like inflammation, uh, insulin, stress. So we'll sort of see those common themes will push the alpha more. So Working on addressing that helps. But then we look at what we call 5-alpha blockers. So they're natural supplements like saw palmetto, stinging nettle root, um, zinc, EGCG, that's in green tea, uh, reishi mushroom, um, pygium, which is known as pygium africanum. So all these things help lessen the load on the alpha side and kind of push it a little bit more towards the beta side. And it works in men just as much as it works at women. So I tease women all the time. You're going to see these products and prostate formulas. You'll probably need the same formula. I just paid no attention to the title. <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, I recently interviewed uh, Frank Nort from mm. uh, Ryan Labs. Yeah. He, and, you know, they do 24-hour urine testing. And he mm -hmm. said, there's no scientific validation for dry urine testing. Is that we, it's not true. In fact, we have a great study that just came out. Yeah, no, in I fact, it's I read it. public. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. No, there's there's research coming, and we have another one coming with that behind that as well. So, and so what did, what did yeah. that paper show? 
That one was in particular for estrogen and progesterone in blood, and it showed that it has great correlation. So dried urine, when you're looking at estradiol, estrone, estradiol, comparing it to um, serum, uh, had great correlation. So it, you can effectively use it for hormones. Cool. Yeah. So when it comes to women's hormones, um, I'd like to touch on um, the metabolism of estrogen and what increases risk of breast cancer. Mm -hmm. For years, we used to measure the 2 to 16 ratio, and that we thought was the holy grail. And more 2 was safe. That was anti-carcinogenic, and 16 was bad, and 4 we weren't quite sure about. And then they started it started to be in a bunch of papers that seemed to show that it really wasn't valid. It was, mm -hmm. you know, 16 wasn't necessarily correlated with anything. And then uh, it, it seems like more of the interesting research has been done with the four as mm -hmm. potentially being related to cancer. But I, I just did like a quick literature search and I saw several papers from like 2017 that seemed to be validating the two to 16 ratio again. So what do so, you think we are? Yeah. So here's the thing with, with cancer that um, what originally said the two sixteen. So the two and the four are considered catechol estrogens, which means they can form adducts, A D D U C T S adducts. So the reason the two hydroxy is considered safer is that when two becomes an addict, if it doesn't get methylated, if it doesn't go through phase two, and it binds to DNA and forms an addict, it, like a very obedient child, it just stays in the DNA. It's not supposed to be there, but it stays there and it waits for your DNA excision, your, you know, your basically your DNA repair system to come in, notice it's a problem, and then fix it. Whereas the four, the four pathway, when it becomes an addict with the DNA, um, it's a very naughty child and it breaks out of the DNA and leaves a hole. And when, these, when the four addicts break off and the more four addicts you have breaking off, the more holes you have in your DNA. Now your DNA repair system's like crap and full of holes and it has to increase repair, so to speak, and the risk for mutation goes up. So it's like a factory that's been given a double, triple, quadruple order, and yet you don't have the people, you know, the machines, the what have you to make it happen. So mistakes happen, things get missed, things slip through that quality assurance maybe before would have been fine. So now you have this increased risk for mutation. So the 16 pathway doesn't increase the risk for addicts, but it can increase proliferation. So good for bones, bad for boobs. So it, it's also bad for other things, heavy periods. So if I see somebody who has a higher 16 in their, um, in their result and they report clotty periods, heavy periods, uh, their breasts get large and tender, then I know that they've got this proliferative effect. If you have breast cancer, it's proliferative. So you definitely don't want a whole lot of 16 because it's just going to add fuel to the fire, but it's the four that really increases your risk for that addict mutation when it's trying to fix it, fix the hole. And so based on looking at these metabolites, how do we know how to fix the um, metabolism so that we decrease cancer risk without over methylating? Right. So now with, with urine testing, you cannot tell if somebody is an over or hyper methylator. You can okay. only do that through SNP testing. Okay. Now, on urine, any urine, dried urine, 24 hour urine, Frank's urine, doesn't matter, his <laughs> Ryan Labs. Um, if somebody has hot, quote, high methylation, it just means the ratio between their ability to get from phase one, the hydroxy phase, to phase two, the methoxy phase, looks really in the favor of, of methylation. But does that actually mean they have the fast comp? I don't know. I won't know that until you do SNP testing. Well, but, couldn't, couldn't okay. we tell by looking at like uh, B12? I noticed that you have a marker of B12 in some of your testing now. We do. We have one of that. We have MMA. So we have the organic acid, full methamalonate. Yeah, we do have that marker. And we also have um, HVA and VMA, which are oh. also, of course, broken down by Compt. I mean, MAO as well, but they are broken down by so Compt. So could you use that as a way to tell how much your methyl? No, it's still not absolute. It's okay. still not absolute. So they're, they're um, good markers, good indicator markers. But if somebody's like, does this mean that I have a fast comp? I don't know. I, I, 100% I don't know until I actually see your SNP test. But even if, you, even if you have a SNP, I still how do you know how much? To correct. Correct. And because you could have normal, right? You could have heterozygous, not even a fast right. comp. You can have a heterozygous comp, but yet whatever you're doing and or something is speeding it up. 
And then if you knock that off, it'll, it'll go back to normal or slow back down. Or it'll, maybe if the, you know, you are a homozygous fast person, but on testing, everything looks normal. And you're like, well, it's not manifesting. I have a fast comp, but it's not showing up on test. But if you have things on testing that look like it should be fast, and you know on SNP testing you have the fast uh, um, results, then like then there you go, <laughs> you're fast. <laughs> then it lines up absolutely. Yes. Now, does your test measure whether the four is getting methylated or not? We don't look at the four. We don't look at the four. And the reason we don't is because the result for four, it's so tiny that the accuracy gets very, very messy. And that's what we find when we look at a lot of the other companies is that when you look at the reference ranges, it's like 0.000 or 0, 0.00 whatever. Um, and once you get into the more than one zeros, it's, it can be really messy really quickly. And um, I have heard from other people who use other companies that it's a struggle because it often looks poor but when it's in the cancer world that's really concerning you know because then you freak out oh my gosh my four is not methylating i'm gonna get cancer but really it might just be noise and messiness so we choose we can run it we choose not to run it to um not mislead practitioners since we're not a hundred percent when it comes to that something that small right it's too bad yeah. that there's not some way to measure that because that might be a way to decide like how yes. much methyl B vitamins to give. Yes. Yeah. Or any, yeah, exactly. Exactly. I mean, it's definitely um, a work in progress in trying to figure out the best way. Yeah, most definitely. Right. Um, so um, how can we use dry urine testing to map out a woman's cycle? And, yeah. you know, what can that tell us? Like, how can that help with fertility problems or PCOS or things like that? Definitely. In fact, um, ours is called the cycle mapping. I just did mine. I do mine every January. And so um, much like saliva, a lot of people are familiar with doing the month long saliva collection. Um, you can do the month long dried urine testing if you're looking for the entire month. So it's very easy. It's very straightforward. Basically, almost every morning of your cycle, you will urinate on a piece of paper and let it dry. And then by the time you get your next period comes, then you mail everything in and the estrogen and the progesterone is tracked out through the month. So it's really great for women who have cycle irregularity. Um, maybe they've had a partial hysterectomy or an ablation or they have the Marina IUD and so they have ovaries that function but they don't bleed so they don't quite know where they are in their cycle. Uh, women with a lot of fertility issues. Uh, women who have symptoms all month long. I have a lot of women that say, I'm symptomatic at ovulation. I'm symptomatic you know, from ovulation until my period comes. And so you need a much bigger picture. You need all month long as opposed to just a one day snapshot. So I do mine um, every January. This January, I was doing the fasting mimicking diet. So I did it at the same time. I was doing the fasting mimicking diet. I was doing cortisol collection and the cycle mapping. And I'm doing my washout um, next month. I will collect a cycle map again. To now I'll be a month removed from the fasting mimicking diet to see wow. what, how it looks. So what did you find uh, with the fasting mimicking diet and cycle mapping? Um, so my cycle look mapping, um, I did it last year. So all I have to compare it to was last year. So last year, I, my uh, progesterone rise is pathetic. Oh my gosh, that is pathetic. So sad. But my estrogen is really high in the luteal phase. And then this, when I just got the results back, my progesterone looks better. And my estrogen is not nearly as high, which I don't know yet if that's my normal or if that, because a year is spanned and I've done a lot of work, um, or if that was the effect of the fasting mimicking diet. So I'm waiting a month and then I'll do it for the month of March um, and I'll compare January then to March. And if they look the exact same, then, or maybe March will look better, maybe March will look worse, and then we'll compare and see what's going on. So I'm collecting a lot of my own data points to see what's happening. Yeah. So how well, cortisol. how well does dry urine help us to monitor women who are on hormones? Um, on, so as long as it's bioidentical hormones, great. Obviously, if it's synthetic, if like, for example, they're on the birth control pill, um, no testing is good if somebody is on the birth control pill, the patch, the ring, because of the mechanism of action of that synthetic hormone. Um, but if somebody's on oral progesterone, DHEA, vaginal estrogen, um, even bioidentical, like S-string, which is a prescription ring, but it's estradiol, um, that estrogen patch that menopausal women use, 
uh, pellets, a lot of pellet therapy out there right now. Um, great, it works really great for that. You did mention with topical hormone, topical hormone can be a little bit of a challenge, of course, for dried urine, um, right. but we find that topical hormone, as you probably know, is challenging in, in really any testing realm. There's no great, we can't control topical hormone. It depends on the tissue it's in. Um, if you rub it in the inner thigh, if you rub it on the belly, if you rub it on your inner arm, um, it, if you're far away, you know, from the saliva gland, close to the saliva gland, they've shown that, you know, the, the levels can definitely vary. Um, if you rub it on topically, what it is in the endometrium, what it is in the breast tissue, what it is in that skin right there varies. And that's what makes it challenging, especially topical progesterone. A step, especially progesterone is just its own beast when it comes to the topical nature. But as far as other hormone monitoring goes, great. It's used often. Right. Yeah. And, and I understand it's not as effective for progesterone monitoring, right? Topical, true? topical, just like saliva. Saliva has a lot of caveats with topical progesterone. Yeah. But with oral progesterone, um, people can, we, much like saliva, we, we adjust the ranges to account for first pass. Oh, okay. Yeah. So let's talk about the um, cortisol test. Is yeah. The Dutch urinary cortisol test compared to the salivary cortisol test. Yeah, very different. <laughs> so with salivary cortisol, you're looking at free cortisol at certain points through the day. For usually salivary does first thing in the morning around lunch, around dinner and before bed. So that gives you the free and active uh, cortisol. With dried urine, you get three things. You get metabolized cortisol, which sort of gives you the idea of can your adrenals even make cortisol in the first place, which are potential. You get the free cortisol, the bioavailable, because that's what comes through. And you get cortisone, which is inactive. So I can tell you, can you make it? How much is free in the pattern? And then what's getting deactivated? Because some people might have really low free cortisol and it's not a production problem. It's a deactivation problem and the treatment's different. Hmm. So it's nice to see. And some people have everything. They don't make it. They don't have a lot of free. Whatever they do make, they deactivate. And then those people are tired. <laughs> what do you do if it's deactivated? What does it mean for your cortisol to be deactivated? So your body always preferentially makes cortisol and it can deactivate it to cortisone, not hydrocortisone, what everybody's used to. Hydrocortisone, the topical that you get at the pharmacy, that's actually cortisol. It's just a pharmaceutical naming thing cortisone is inactive. It's the inactive form of cortisol. And the body can flip it back and forth depending on the location, the receptors it's around and the need of the body. So you may, if you systemically have an upregulation in the enzyme that deactivates cortisol, then you're going to have a lot more cortisone. Your body is not going to have a lot of cortisol available. We see this a lot with chronic long-term sort of stress states where the body is trying to get you to slow down. So when it's like, um, my analogy is like the body is tired of you burning the candle at both ends. So it will force you to slow down. It will convert to cortisone. The other time we see it all the time is uh, immediately after illness, right? So you've been sick, you got the flu this season, you're back at work, but you're super tired. You, you know, you see patients, but you need to sit down in between, you're out of breath. We see that a lot of times the body is part of the healing. We'll convert into cortisone. It's sort of one of those, if we slow you down, try to get you to heal longer, or hopefully you'll, you'll rest so that you can heal faster, I mean, so versus people who get sick and it seems to linger around for a while. So those are the two big reasons that we'll see cortisone be a lot higher on testing. So does this tie into the whole issue about adrenal fatigue? And if we see somebody with a fairly flat mm -hmm. cortisol level, and we've traditionally thought that the adrenal gland is burned out and can't produce cortisol, <laughs> that really what's happening is, is a lot of it's being deactivated? It depends. So if the metabolized cortisol is low, then it, and remember, the, uh, unless it's Addison's disease, which is the autoimmune condition, um, the adrenal glands don't burn out. They don't run out of cells. You know, it's, it's brain, um, it's the brain where all the communication comes from. So if the metabolized cortisol is low, then that means the brain is not telling the adrenal gland to make cortisol. Therefore, the free cortisol is low. Now, if your cortisone is high, though, then you may have low flat cortisol because everything's getting deactivated to cortisone. So in that case, it's not an adrenal issue 
at all. It's not an HPA, meaning the brain is not telling the adrenal to make cortisol. It's getting deactivated. So why, why would the brain stop, tell the um, adrenals to make less cortisol? Lots of reasons, right? Over time, you get a lot. You get a lot of feedback up to the brain to make less cortisol. You've got receptor issues. You've got tissue issues. But a lot of times, it's um, it's like a child that's trying to get its mom's attention, and so it says it over and over. Right? Mom, 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 mom. And so you get this down regulation because the body initially puts out lots of cortisol, and then it's like, oh, good gracious, and it starts to down regulate the cortisol. And so it's more of a brain down as opposed to the adrenal gland itself. And again, this is assuming it's not Addison's. It's just over time, people get this down regulation. We also get assaults from all sort of, you know, environmental toxicants. We're surrounded by viruses and mold and these and other infections. Again, initially it might bring your cortisol up, but over time, it'll start to drop it down. The brain starts to down regulate the cortisol response. Now, you know, myself and a number of other, uh, a lot of functional medicine practitioners I've spoken to over the years, when we have patients who have this fatigue and, 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 and you do one of these salivary cortisol tests and it shows that the cortisol levels are lower, or flatlined or something like that. And then we use various sorts of supplements to help mm -hmm. Um, support the adrenal glands, either we use adaptogens or we use glandulars or combinations. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times those patients get better. Yeah. It's not that the adrenal glands are not producing. What are we really doing and why is it working? Right. Well, think about it. So everybody, and I point this out all the time in lectures and people are like, oh yeah, of course. We give herbs that are adrenal adaptogens, ashwagandha, rhodiola, eleutherococcus, but they are not just adrenal adaptogens, right? They don't just hone in on the adrenal glands. They're very immune supportive. They're very thyroid supportive. And they're very digestive supportive, depending where they are. They're very neurologic supportive. And so when you give a quote unquote adrenal adaptogen, it's the, the title is misleading. Yes, absolutely. It helps the HPA axis, but it's a very broad spectrum mm -hmm. helper type of you know, herb. And so you're getting the immune support, you're getting the neuro support, you're getting the GI, the thyroid support. You just forgot because you called it an adrenal adaptogen or you told the patient, oh, it's, it's ashwagandha. It's, it's for your adrenals. But ashwagandha is supportive for the thyroid, absolutely, in the immune system. So and maybe with the glandulars, we're getting a good quality amino acid. Yeah, absolutely. Right. You know? Absolutely. And it depends what, what glandular that you use. A lot of companies will, will mix a few together. They'll put adrenal and they'll add in some other, you know, thymus or spleen or whatnot in your brain. You know, they'll put in hypothalamus or thyroid. So you've got this like minute blend of some other really good glandulars that are helpful for other parts of the body. And now things are working again because you've got support from a systemic point of view. You just, patients just didn't realize it. Cool. Can you yeah. talk about the cortisol awakening response and how you measure it with your test and what the oh, yeah. significance of this is? It's one of my favorite tests, actually. So the cortisol awakening response, the CAR. So um, when you wake up in the morning, when your eyes open up, then the signal goes from your brain to your adrenals to make cortisol right now. So while you were sleeping, the signal is starting to get bigger and bigger and bigger, but the adrenals aren't aren't listening because you haven't yet opened your eyes. Once you open your eyes, all bets are off. Signal goes up, cortisol comes out. Your cortisol goes up exponentially in about 30 minutes. It goes up in about 30 minutes-ish. And then after about 60 minutes, starts to fall back down. And that initial up down in 30 to 60 minutes is what's known as the cortisol awakening response. It's super important. They call it the mini stress test of your day because it's what gets your butt out of bed. It's what helps you deal with the fact that you haven't had breakfast yet. So it's blood sugar balancing. It helps with inflammation, your immune system. It helps um, reduce autoimmunity. Um, and if you can't get that right, if you overshoot, if you're too high, or if you undershoot, you're too low, or you're flatlined, then you're not going to get the rest of your day right either is what they say. So if you can't get that right, you're going to miss a lot of other important parts of your adrenal response because you can't get that part. So you're going to have inflammation issues. You're going to have blood sugar issues. You might have autoimmune issues because you don't get that initial car right. So it's, the, it's a neat little test for those people who are really struggling with all sorts of symptoms. And so let's say somebody has um, 
doesn't have that initial response. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, um, but then the rest of their adrenal pattern is normal. Mm -hmm. Well, but remember, it's going down. So it's easy to go down. It's hard to go up. <laughs> So with the rest of the day normal, what you'll just what you'll see is maybe their afternoon and their dinner point in range. But right. what you don't know is if their response to things have been normal, right? So right. you don't know if those people right. are having normal responses to stress, normal responses to blood sugar okay. issues, normal responses to pain. I got it. All you see are the two the point in the afternoon and the point at night, right? Okay. And and usually I'm sure you have your patients tell you, uh, no, I don't I don't feel normal. <laughs> Right. Usually they, they say, no, right. I, I have hyper or hypoglycemia. Um, yes, I have pain. I feel more inflamed. My autoimmune is worse. I can't sleep. You know, you'll get these symptoms. Right. Yep. Now, I know one of the issues with the salivary cortisol testing is that um, it seems, especially to women, say, I can't fill up that little tube. And right. So I know your testing uses a different method, right? We do. So the cortisol awakening response can only be done in saliva. So while we are a dried urine company, when we do this, the cortisol awakening response, we do have a saliva component of it. Our saliva component are on these little um, like sort of microfiber, basically like a cotton swab. And so people are, um, yeah, like a wad of cotton. And so people just put it in their mouth and get it wet um, when they're, as they're doing the testing. So there's no spitting. They just have to put cotton in their mouth and get it wet and then put it back in the tube. The reason we can do that is we don't pull other hormone off of the cotton swabs. You can't pull hormone, um, especially progesterone off, off of the co those cotton swabs. There's a lot of interference. And so saliva companies um, have tried in the past to be do the cotton swabs, but then they realized to get the rest of the hormones, they need free flowing saliva. Um, but cortisol does not have that problem in the cotton swab. So that's how we can use it. Because we pull hormones off the dried urine and cortisol, when we're doing the cortisol awakening response off the cotton swab. Yeah, I've heard some discussion of one of the issues with doing this kind of test uh, with the spitting into the little tubes is if the person stresses out about it, then it's they're going to create an adrenal cortisol response just yeah. trying to fulfill the test. And the other, and I hear this response as well, is you've got 30 minutes you have when you're doing the cortisol awakening response. So you wake up, let's say you wake up at six in the morning and you immediately have to fill up the tube with saliva and then, but you have to do it again at 6.30 in the morning and then you have to do it again at seven in the morning. And that can be really time consuming if you're also trying to live your life or get ready for work or get your kids up and going. And if, you're, if it takes you 10, 15, 20 minutes to fill a tube, but you have to do it every 30 minutes, um, I have definitely had that feedback that it is uh, a challenge. So some companies, what they've done to counter that is they've shortened their tubes. So there are a few companies that have uh, heard people's complaints and now make smaller tubes for the cortisol awakening response. So uh, not as much saliva is needed. I see. And the first, the first test tube, uh, the first tube um, has to be done within like five minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Which is the other problem because if you're still trying to spit in a tube 20 minutes later, like you've, you're sort of missing the point. <laughs> and you can't get up and get a glass of water and things no, like that. No, you'll dilute it. You can't do it. You right. can't eat. You can't drink. You can't wash your mouth out. You can't do any of that because you will, you will dilute the saliva. You can't dilute the saliva. Yeah. Now, but what about doing a urine test? What if you can't urinate? I mean, do you just drink as much water as you can? Or is that you can't, no. So the first morning, the first test is very easy because usually most people have to wake up and go to the bathroom. Um, right. With the Dutch test, we, um, when we're doing the hormone part, you do it on waking and then two hours later. So in between those two hours, we suggest people drink no more than eight ounces of fluid. And the reason is we're a urine test. So don't dilute it. Just like with saliva, you don't want to drink water and then spit in the tube because you'll dilute it. So if you drink copious amounts of water and hope to help yourself urinate, um, then you will dilute the results. So we do suggest no more than eight ounces um, in between the, that two hour mark, which can pose a problem for some people still, but so far most people, we don't require much. And so uh, just a little bit to saturate the filter paper. Cool. Yeah. Good, good. So I think those are the questions that I had prepared for you for today. And I think that was a good amount of information for Yeah, covered a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so how can our listeners and viewers uh, find out about the Dutch testing? 
Um, easy enough, website, dutchtest.com. Everything on there is free. You don't have to be an actual practitioner. Um, right now, all our videos and webinars and guide sheets and whatnot are um, all on there and they're all available so people can and, go learn. And what about patients? Can patients order the test directly themselves? or um, They can order the test directly themselves. Unfortunately, um, when they do order it from themselves, themselves, we do have a mark, we have quite a markup on there and we don't give any medical support. So if somebody orders it themselves, we can, we do refer them. We have a Dutch provider referral network that we refer to every day all the time, um, but we strongly encourage people to find the provider first and go through their provider to order the test because then of course they'll get good quality care as opposed to floundering, or floundering around by themselves. Right, so their best bet, yeah, find a functional medicine. Find it, and we can help with that people, yep, yep, come see you. <laughs> Call the lab, let us know where you live. We can direct you to somebody who's um, you know Dutch qualified and then uh, they can help, yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Carrie. Yeah, thanks so much. I appreciate it.